Okay, hello everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about the passionate shepherd to his love by the English poet and playwright Edmund Spencer. Um, he's one of the most important and prominent um, uh, writers, poets and playwrights during the Elizabethan age. Actually, uh, Edmund, uh, Sir uh, Christopher, sorry, for Christopher Marlowe, sorry, not Edmund Spencer, but Christopher Marlowe, the passionate shepherd to his love, uh, Christopher Marlowe. He is uh, one of one of the most known, uh, well-established and prominent figures in the Elizabethan in the Elizabethan literature. He's known for his uh, important plays. He was a good and uh, towering playwright and a poet during the Elizabethan age. Um, we're going to move to directly to the poem here and let's have a look at the listen to a recitation for the poem and after that we're going to talk about the poem in details. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields, and we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. And I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. A gown made of the finest wool which from our pretty lambs we pull, fair lined slippers for the cold, with buckles of the purest gold, a belt of straw and ivy buds, with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherd's swains shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. Come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields, and we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. And I will make thee beds of roses 
and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers and a kirtle, embroidered all with leaves of myrtle. A gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lambs we pull. Fair lined slippers for the cold, with buckles of the purest gold. A belt of straw and ivy buds, with coral clasps and amber studs. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherd's swains shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. Now, in order to talk about this and start the process of analyzing this poem by Christopher Marlowe, we need to start by the title. The title of the, this poem is very telling here. During, sorry, here. <clears throat> During those ages, not every writer used to put a title for the poem he writes. However, at the case of this poem, which is the, the passionate shepherd to his love, the poet Christopher Marlowe provides a title for his poem, which is the passionate shepherd to his love. Here we can tell that this poem we have a speaker, and uh, we have a speaker. And the speaker is, is the shepherd. So we need to differentiate between two things here. The writer, who is Christopher Marlowe, okay, and the speaker in this poem, who is the, at this case, at this poem, he is the, uh, the shepherd. Besides, the shepherd in describing the passion, he Besides, the, 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 the shepherd is described as passionate, okay, which indicates that he is in great love. However, the speaker who is the, passion, who is the shepherd is dedicating his love and his, his feelings to a lady who he loves. The addressee here is a woman. So, from the very beginning of the title, we have a speaker, a situation, and an addressee. So, we have a process of message delivery. We have a sender, a one, a person who is speaking, who is the passionate shepherd or the shepherd. We have a message, which is, which is a message of love. We have uh, an addressee or a receiver for this, uh, for this uh, message, who is the lady or the beloved besides the title indicates that we have or we can say that the poem has one dominating voice which is the voice of the shepherd the passionate shepherd to his love so most mostly we're, as we're going to say later on in the uh, poem, we have a one-way message, which is moving or going from the passionate shepherd, the shepherd himself, the speaker of this poem, in this poem, to the beloved. Okay? The title doesn't indicate that there would be a sort of dialogue, interaction between the two parts of the of the message the sender and the receiver or the speaker and the addressee okay which indicates something important here which will be an additional sort of discussion further on which is the the woman here 
the one the address C as we're going to see in the poem she is in most parts of the poem she is silenced the woman here doesn't uh, doesn't have uh, or the, the 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 poem or the the woman the uh, is not speaking is silenced here okay and we need to differentiate between silent the woman is silent or silenced and the slight difference here is it might be that the lady is silent by choosing to be silent. She is silent by her own will. This is one choice. And the second choice is that the lady, as a way of tradition, as a way of behavior, or as a way of oppression, she is forced to be silenced. Okay? And this will be discussed in the uh, in details later on from the <clears throat> layout the form and the the musicality the the poem is in six stanzas each stanza lies in four lines each stanza is separated by something we call the lyrical or poetic gap Okay. And each stanza can be a unit by itself. Still, each stanza is part of the whole poem. The second thing here we need to pay attention to is the rhyme and the meter. <clears throat> we have already just talked and discussed and thoroughly uh, addressed the idea or the thing that we call or the type of meter we call iambic pentameter that was used in uh, or followed by uh, William Shakespeare while writing his sonnets. But here Christopher Marlowe is using a different type of pentameters which is the iambic tetrameter, tetrameter, the iambic tetrameter. This is it. And the iambic pentameter, we were to, we said that the iambic pentameter is formed of uh, five feet. Each feet uh, consists of two or three syllables. Okay. Uh, at the moment, the iambic pentameter is formed or divided into five feet, and each feet consists of two or three um, syllables. The iambic tetrameter is formed from or divided into four meters, so sorry, four feet. And each feet is divided or comprised of two syllables or two cells. <clears throat> okay, let's have a look here. When you talk about the iambic tetrameter, this is an example of the iambic tetrameter. Come is one syllable, live. Is, an, is, a, is another syllable with another syllable me another syllable and another syllable be another syllable my another syllable and love is another syllable here each word here is one syllable so in order to form a feat come live is the first feat that those two syllables are the first feet with me is the second feet and B is the third feet and my love is the fourth feet number three the iambic tetrameter goes from uh, from and starts with an unstressed syllable and the second syllable is uh, stressed come live come live with me with me with me and B and B, my love, my love, okay? So usually, the, the syllables that are stressed here is live, me, be, love, okay? So, <clears throat> pay attention here to the difference between the iambic pentameter and the iambic tetrameter. So, here at the case, again, at the case of Christopher Marlowe, Christopher Marlowe in this poem is using the iambic tetrameter 
What is the ion pictometer? The ion pictometer is a meter that uses four feet. Each feet is divided into two syllables, and it starts with an unstressed, followed with the uh, each feet starts with the with an with an initial or a first syllable that is unstressed, followed by a second syllable that is stressed. The same thing can go on, and we. This is the second feet, stressed, unstressed, and this is one the, the one that is stressed. Two syllables. Will, uh, will all, will all, unstressed, stressed, the second feet. Okay. The pledge, the play. Okay. And pleasure here is divided into two syllables. So, the and the first syllable of pleasure form the, the third feet. The second syllable of pleasure with prove form the fourth feet. That hills and valleys. The same thing we need to pay attention to the word valleys. Valleys is into two, there is falls into two syllables. The first syllable goes with and to form the third, the second feet. Sorry. Okay. The second feet, the second syllable with Del form the third feet and field form the fourth feet. The same thing goes uh, in the same the same way. Something will be left for the discussion during the Zoom meeting, which is the uh, the last line. I need you to think about it and see how many syllables do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. We have nine syllables here. Okay. The question here is that: Is there any reason behind breaking this pattern here? Number one, and if the pattern is broken here, what is the reason of breaking this pattern? Number three, is the speaker or the meter of the poem here? following or inconsistent with is is inconsistency with the overall musicality of the poem or not if it's so okay how would that work with a line that is comprised of nine syllables instead of eight okay so usually when we talk about i need to refer back to what what we call the Iampic tetrameter, which is mainly comprised of or divided into four feet. Each feet has two two syllables. So in each line, we are supposed to well, supposedly we are we have to have uh, uh, eight 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 syllables. Still, we have nine here. Just think about it, and we will leave that for discussion. Okay, now. Let's look now at the rhyme scheme, at the rhyme scheme. Those are important things when we don't want to talk about poetry here. Look at the rhyme scheme. Love, love, a, prove, v, a, okay? Field, ld, b, yield, yield, b. So the rhyme scheme goes A, A, B, B, the first stanza. And then second stanza, rocks and folks, rocks and folks, x, 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 okay? And uh, falls and falls and madrigals, l's, l's, okay? So the rhyme scheme here in the second stanza is C, C, D, D. What we can infer here is that the stanzas of this poem go like for each stanza A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, okay? But for the sake of, for the sake of, uh, of continuity, okay, uh, we say A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, okay? Or you can write them in the same way a a for in this poem a a b b a a b b instead of c c d d the most important thing that the two 
the each two following lines or each two consecutive lines in each poem are following the same rhyme are following the same line as we see love and love love and prove uh, field and yield rocks and uh, folks falls and madigals els els folks folks yield yield v v okay this is about the musicality and the uh, the rhyme scheme so Another uh, musical feature here, an example from one of the lines with coal chips and amber uh, and amber studs. We can notice here that the, the speaker, that the writer, Christopher Marlowe, is using what we call assonance. And when we say assonance, we are talking about the repetition of a vowel sound, the repetition of the vowel sound. And by doing so, we can see that the word, the, the sound a ah, here, a ah, a ah, sorry, a ah, and a ah, is repeated three times in the uh, in this line. So more and more contributing to the musicality of the text. In the second video, we're going to talk about the symbolism, uh, the figures of speech that are mainly addressed in this video. Thank you.